Good morning, Steve. Good morning. How are you feeling? Hungry. I imagine so. Um, well, Steve, I, uh, as you know, we did some tests, and uh, I wanted to go over your test results with you, but of course, you know, they weren't uh, biological tests, they were behavioral tests. So um, what you didn't know was that I had my intern, Kevin, follow you around for two weeks and take copious notes of everything that you were eating. He was outside your house with binoculars, and he's writing down things that you were eating and, and who you're eating with and how you're eating. And so I just want to go over some things that he noted, if that's okay. Can you stop here? Uh, no, we're not going to stop here. <laughs> um, first of all, he noticed a theme of mindless eating. You're just eating on the go, you're grazing when you're at home, you're, you're just eating without really thinking about or acknowledging the fact that you're eating. And really what that leads to is a lot of thankless eating. You, know, you, you are sort of forgetting where this food is coming from and, and who is providing it for you. Um, he also noticed there's a lot of uh, fine foods. Uh, a lot of delicacies and decadent foods from around the world. And, we're, and, and you know, a little bit of that is okay, but uh, we're talking on a daily basis. And then he also noticed that uh, on a couple of occasions you had some people over and you were eating with a group of people and there was someone who was being excluded. Um, and I don't know who that was and I don't need to know. I just have it written down here on your chart. Now, Steve, as a board-certified physicist, this all for me points to one thing, um, and it's not good. It's like bad news bears, okay? Um, the, the diagnosis is something called... Sorry, there's an earring on you. The diagnosis is something called hyperphagic consumption. Um, it's the, the street name for it is gluttony. And it seems like you've got a really bad case, Steve. Um, and now the thing is, gluttony, a lot of people don't realize, is a... Uh, <laughs> gluttony is a heart condition. A lot of people think that gluttony is a, a mouth disorder, that it's an eating thing, but really it's a condition of the heart. Uh, gluttony is essentially thinking of yourself as an autonomous, self-sustaining individual, that by my own sweat... I have provided this food for myself. Um, and it's really hard to know how many people are affected by gluttony. Um, I, I would suppose that there are probably millions of people living with the condition and they don't even realize it. Uh, but let's talk for just a minute about what causes gluttony. Uh, the first thing I think is there's just a popular misconception about uh, what gluttony really is. So what, what would you say... What comes to mind when you think of what a glutton is? Only thinking about eating yeah. food. And yeah, maybe a picture of someone with you know, 16 Big Macs and a 12-pack of soda and a bucket of fried chicken, and they're slouched on the couch with grease all over their face. <laughs> right, that's kind of the, uh, that's the caricature of what gluttony is. And really, that's a, a destructive caricature, because then you've got a lot of people who think, well, as long as I'm not that, then I'm okay. I'm not a glutton. As long as I'm not uh, you know, sitting there with grease all over my face, then I'm, I'm doing okay. Go me. And so it's able to kind of slip in undetected. And that's why I think you have so many people that, that suffer from the affliction and they don't even know it. Um, so really, you could be 110 pounds and eat salad all the time and still be a glutton. Because it's not about the, the amount of food that you're eating. It's the attitude of your heart and the thankfulness of your heart not being there. Uh, the, uh, another thing is sort of an environmental cause. Um, the environmental thing is there's this message in our environment that food is essentially just a, a delicious lump of calories and carbs and protein and fiber and all these things that we just need to kind of keep in balance to be generally healthy. But food is just fuel to keep this, uh, this machine going. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we have good gas going in the tank, but really it's just a lump of calories. 
And what that can lead to that's really destructive is to think that eating is not a spiritual activity, that it's just, uh, the medical term is adiaphora, that it just, it doesn't matter. It's neither here nor there. But you think about this. As you read the Bible, the first sin is eating something that they shouldn't. Adam and Eve in the garden, they eat something trying to sustain themselves and look out for themselves. Essentially, the first sin is a form of gluttony. Uh, when God brings Israel out of Egypt, uh, he gives them a festival or, or a, a holiday to commemorate their deliverance, and they don't celebrate by giving presents, and they don't celebrate by shooting off fireworks. They celebrate by having a Passover meal. Food is the way that Israel celebrates the fact that God has made life possible for them. Or when they're in the wilderness uh, and, and God's faithfulness is in question and how is life going to be possible without Pharaoh? And so God sends them bread and he sends them meat and he provides water from rocks. He sustains them with food. Uh, in, the, in the law, when you look over the sacrifices, there are uh, several different sacrifices in the book of Leviticus and most of them are not complete until you've eaten the sacrifice. So you have uh, uh, the, the grain offering and the peace offering and Thanksgiving offering and all these. You, you go and you offer something to God, but then that's not really finished until you have taken your part and eaten, eaten it and dined with God. So eating is a part of worship. And then when God wants to separate Israel from the rest of the nations, one of the ways he does that is by giving them uh, kosher laws. These are foods you can eat. These are foods you can't eat. Uh, one of the ways that the, the Nazarite, who's this, someone who takes a special vow, one of the ways they are set aside is uh, that they will not eat meat because they can't touch a dead body, and they aren't allowed to deal with grapes. They can't touch anything with grapes, and so they're not allowed to drink wine. So eating and drinking has to do with uh, being set apart for God. Think about Daniel and uh, David and Jesus all fast when they're seeking the will of God. They abstain from eating. When the prophets talk about how great the destruction on Israel is going to be, they say other nations are going to come in and they're going to eat your food. Um, and really, if you read the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are only a few stories that appear in all four of those. And one of them is uh, the resurrection, obviously, but the only other miracle that appears in all four is the feeding of the 5,000. So apparently, in the early church, when you want to tell the story of Jesus, you don't tell the story of Jesus without telling about the feeding of the 5,000. Um, Jesus is accused not for hanging out with tax collectors and sinners or greeting them in the marketplace, but for eating with them. Of the two great rites that he left for the church, one is baptism and the other is the Lord's Supper. You think about the fact that every week we gather together and we eat together. And then in, uh, in the book of Revelation, when we get this picture of what heaven is going to be like in the New Jerusalem, food is a big part of that. So I think this environmental message that food is just fuel and nothing more, I think that's destructive. because It can lead to this idea that eating is not spiritual, and it very much is. Uh, and then there's also uh, genetic causes for gluttony. And when I say genetic causes, you should realize I'm not talking about genetic causes for obesity. Because I'm, Steve, I'm not a real doctor. Um, <laughs> I, that's way above my pay grade. I don't actually understand DNA. What I understand is that we are born with this tendency towards self-reliance and a tendency toward anxiety and covetousness. That really, we, we're worried that there won't be enough, and so we want to gather, and we want to think that I have provided for me. Uh, and really, I think that anxiety means that we are intimidated by the truth. And the truth is that gluttony is a funny-sounding word for a really serious and widespread condition. The truth that we may actually already be gluttons and not even realize it. Or the truth that to address gluttony would have to mean that we change the way that we eat or that God cares about food. So those are kind of the, the three big causes, this popular misconception of grease on my face, and uh, this environmental message that food is just fuel and nothing more. 
and uh, this genetic predisposition towards self-reliance. And Steve, the prognosis, which I'm sure is what you're really worried about, is not good. Things are not going to get better. Uh, you don't just grow out of this. Um, the only way to deal with it is with direct, intentional intervention. And on, you know, what that means, though, is that there is no magic pill, and there is no vaccination, which I see on your chart you're allergic to needles, so that's good. <laughs> um, but there, there is no miracle drug that I can give you to heal gluttony. But that doesn't mean we can't do anything. There are a few things that you can do, and so I want to I want to walk through those with you. First of all, I just want to refer you to another doc in our practice. We call him the Wounded Healer. Uh, his real name is Jesus ben Joseph. But we call him the Wounded Healer because of this verse in Isaiah 53. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And that's a little odd because normally wounds don't heal people. Normally they just can lead to infection. Uh, but his wounds do heal. So I want to direct you to him and refer you to him. Uh, you'll have to set up an appointment at the front desk. Uh, but the reason he was wounded is that he had a body. And because he had a body, he knows the pain of st the sting of skinning your knees or uh, touching a hot oven. He, he knows the feeling on the back of your neck or the pit of your stomach when you're ashamed. He knows the, the sensation of frustration or sickness or fear. And really, he understands what it is to be tempted by gluttony. Because he too ate. He understands what it is to eat and to want to attribute this food to himself and to his own sweat and his own labor. But since he was wounded because he had a body, not only has he been through the temptation, but he's also withstood the temptation. And the Bible is adamant about saying that, that he was tempted in every way just like we are, but yet was without sin, or that he was a, a perfect sacrifice because he was without blemish. Uh, and, and so he's, he has withstood this temptation because at every moment of every day, he always remembered the Father who begot him. Especially in the Gospel of John, he, he's pointing to the one who sent him. Remembering that he doesn't create himself, he doesn't sustain himself, but he is sustained and eternally begotten by the Father. And what that means is that he has overcome sin, and not just that he's overcome sin in a general sense, but that he's overcome specifically the sin of gluttony, your sin, Steve. And again, it's pretty bad. So because he's withstood it, you might be thinking, what help is that to me? Uh, but what that means is he can help you. In the book of Hebrews, it says that for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Because he went through it, now he can help you. Steve, do you watch American Ninja Warrior? No. no. Okay, well, let me explain to you. Um, it, it, there's a TV show where there are all these athletes who go through an obstacle course one at a time. And the further you get into the season, the harder and harder the courses get. And you get to a point where you've been sitting there watching. It's a two-hour show. So you get there, you've been watching for an hour, and nobody has finished the course. There's one point that nobody can get past. And you start to think that maybe the course is too hard. Maybe this just can't be done. It is too grueling, and this new obstacle or whatever can't be done. And then there will be this one guy who comes out of left field, and he just flies through, and he finishes the course. And you go, okay, so the course is not too hard. Well, now the next guy gets up, and he's thinking, it can be done. It's not the course's fault. It's my fault. The fact that Jesus has withstood temptation means it can be done. And so when we fail, it's not just that, oh, we, we can't do it. It's too hard. We can't resist temptation. It's too hard. Well, no, we can. It's been done. The problem is not the course. The problem is us. But the difference is when the finisher of American Ninja Warrior finishes, they get off and they stand on the sidelines, and all they can do is cheer on the next guy to go through the course. Maybe he can give him tips or strategies, all he, but all he can do really is give encouragement. He can't give him his own strength. 
And that's what makes the wounded healer so great. He can give you his own strength. He pours out his Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is almost always connected with power. Uh, in Luke uh, chapter 1, maybe chapter 2, uh, it says that, uh, talking about the Virgin Mary, that the Spirit of God will come upon you and the, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the, the power and the Spirit of God are, are the same. Or uh, when Jesus goes somewhere in the power of the Spirit. Or in Acts 1, it says that uh, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, you will receive power when the Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Uh, when Paul is talking to all these different churches, he'll often say that they have the power of the Spirit. So to have the Spirit of God is to have the power to resist temptation, among other things. So first thing, I just I refer you to the wounded healer, get an appointment with him. And then there are two other things that I would have you do, and that is to fast and to feast. Now, that may sound a little odd, so let me, let me just explain that. First of all, fasting. Um, the word fasting has taken on, taken on a host of meanings in our own day. So you can fast from Facebook, or you can fast from uh, sugar, or you can fast from yard work. But if you look per, uh, at the biblical use of the term, fasting is always abstaining from something that your body needs to survive. So when we fast, we are towing the line between life and death. Now... Uh, Essentially, you could say that fasting is an intentional restraint of a life or death craving. Your body craves food, and if it doesn't have it, it'll die. Or it craves water. If it doesn't have it, it'll die. Um, and again, we have this genetic tendency to want to consume, not just with our mouth, but specifically we want to consume food. And fasting is restraining that desire. Um, and one of the reasons I want to send you to the wounded healer is because he understands a little something about fasting. In fact, there's this one time he was out in the wilderness for 40 days fasting, like you do. And uh, the devil himself comes to him and says, uh, you need to turn this rock into bread. Well, Jesus has been hungry for 40 days now, so it's pretty tempting. Now, if he came to me and said, turn this rock into bread, it's not a big temptation because I can't do that. But Jesus can do that, so it's a real temptation. But the temptation is not just to quench his hunger and break his fast. The temptation is to provide bread for himself out of his own power and to attribute his survival to himself. And Jesus refuses to do that. This is how he answers. This is uh, Matthew 4. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, I used to think that what that meant was man doesn't survive just by eating, but he survives by Bible study, uh, which if that's the case, then you know, all the illiterate Christians in the world, they're in a heap of trouble. I think what he means is that man doesn't just survive because we have enough to eat, because we've had our bread for the day. We survive because God speaks, that God continually is speaking us into existence. We exist on the word of God, not just because we have enough. And so in fasting, what we are saying to God is, I survive not because I have enough food, but because you speak me into existence. So I would encourage you to fast. Fasting is essentially reminding us that food is not the only thing keeping us alive. The other thing I want you to do is to feast, which may sound a little more, uh, and a little more fun. Uh, and it may actually sound counterproductive. Like, how can you be trying to fight gluttony with feasting? But remember that gluttony is a heart condition. It's not an eating condition. It's a heart condition. And feasting is essentially a celebration of food as a gift from God. Uh, which is, gluttony is, I may eat, and I may eat a lot, or I may eat a little, but I eat with, without remembering where this comes from and attributing it to me. Feasting is, I eat and remember that God has provided for me. Uh, Israel had several feasts. They, uh, they would do their Feast of Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Wheats, but specifically the Festival of First Fruits was 
when the harvest would come in and they'd go out and they'd cut down their first sheave of grain and they would take it to worship and they would sacrifice it to God as a way of saying thank you and returning the first piece to him. It's a way of celebrating that God has once again provided this harvest for us. Our God has come through again. And whenever Israel talks about its glorious future, whether that's returning from exile or when Jesus comes back, it's almost always talked about in terms of there will be feasting because God has once again come through for us and he has made our life possible. Uh, And the only other thing I would say is feasting is something that we do in community. It's not just, you know, I don't just go to to, uh, McDonald's and get something and, and then I'm sitting in my car eating and then I'm thankful for it. Feasting specifically is eating together. Because what we're trying to get away from is this idea that I am on my own, I'm autonomous, I'm self-sustaining. And when we eat together, we remind ourselves that I am a part of something bigger. I'm a part of a community. And so I think that's, it's really critical that when we feast, that we do it with others. How does that sound? I feel better. You feel better? You think you can do it? At least the feasting part? I feel feel great. All right, well, let me pray with you, and then i got to go see some other patients. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word. Uh, And Lord, we we pray that you will reveal to all of us the ways in which we are tempted um, to attribute our own life to ourselves rather than to you. Lord, we love you, and we pray that you will fill us with your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.